All right, uh, without further ado, um, we will talk today about the Soviet Union and Russia and uh, foreign policy and everything what has been happening. <laughs> yeah. In 40 minutes, that's a tall order. But first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. Actually, the, what, what I'm doing now is I'm talking about my book, which is a, a, a great uh, break uh, from all the other things that I've been doing, which is which have been, you know, talking about uh, things like Russia's war in Ukraine or Sino-Russian relations and God knows what. Um, uh, whereas all at that at the same time, I have been working on that book, a book that I, that is very close to being finished, but it has been very close to being finished for a number of years. And many of you, I see uh, some good friends here present here, will of course recognize this dilemma um, when you have been working on something for so long. It has grown to an immense length uh, uh, and uh, you know your editor tells you this is crazy you have to cut it and you tell the editor no I want to publish it in three volumes and anyway so this has been a process that I've been involved with fortunately however uh, I have I have made a commitment a very firm firm commitment uh, uh, to finish it by May which is which has been as firm as every other commitment I have made over the last three years to finish it within the next couple of months. But I think this time I'm actually fairly close because uh, my reason tells me that I cannot keep, it just cannot just cannot expand like this because at the moment it's already 30 uh, chapters or so. But why is there a need for a new book on the Cold War? Uh, I mean, the timing of course is very interesting because for some time, it's almost like the Cold War studies as a field has kind of withered and died away. It was a very active field in the 1990s as people were trying to reinterpret the Cold War on the basis of new uh, Soviet, formerly Soviet sources. Then those sources were closed off in the early 1990s and the field moved to Eastern Europe. Uh, archives were being opened there. And uh, historians have been studying, trying to reinterpret the origins of the Cold War, its course, how it ended, et cetera. But I think by and large, this sort of exercise, by and large, started to peter out in the early 2000s, just as I entered the field. Why? Because, well, all was said that needed to be said. Who was responsible for the Cold War? Was it Stalin? Was it, you know, the Marshall Plan? Okay, we had so many debates about that. That was just about enough. You know, who was responsible for the end of the Cold War? Was it Reagan? Was it Gorbachev? Again, so much has been said that it seems that there was just not uh, enough interest in that. And of course, there was also parallel interest in, in taking the Cold War to other places. So a whole field blossomed of uh, a Cold War and something else, like the Cold War and Papua New Guinea, for example, or the Cold War and the cultural scene in Brazil in the 1960s. So this kind of things really uh, took the front uh, front page of Cold War studies. And if you look at the issues of, of, of key journals in that field, including Journal of Cold War Studies and Cold War History, you'll see a lot of stuff from the Global South uh, published there in the last decade or so. There was also another particular reason why there was a, a drop off in that broader kind of discussion of what the Cold War was and revisiting some big questions about it. And the reason for that was that, that it seemed that after a relative period of openness in the early 1990s, the Russian archives closed. Therefore, there was nothing that needed to be said or there, there was nothing that could be said. And when I was, by the way, when I was some 20 years ago, when I was working on my PhD, on Sino-Soviet relations. This was already the case. So when I went to Moscow looking for documents, I found just a trickle, very, very little stuff that has not already been picked up by other historians um, in the foreign ministry. The vast bulk of documents was closed. This is where things stood when I picked up this project and began what turned into fairly ambitious work um, I don't know what to call it even. It's it, it's uh, it's so it's I I like to call it Zubok 2.0 in the sense that it kind of revisits some of the same things that Zubok and Plushakov did in the book 
uh, inside the Kremlin's Cold War, or even more so Zubok did in this other book, um, The um, uh, Failed Empire. But it does it from a different theoretical perspective, and it also does it with a new uh, source base. So a little bit about the source base, I think some of you will find this interesting, very counterintuitively. In the last four, five, six years, there has been a remarkable opening in the Russian archives that allows us to reinterpret the key turning points of the Cold War from its origins to its end in the, uh, uh, in, 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 in the late 1980s. What am I talking about here? Release of just maybe hundreds of thousands of documents, new documents on uh, foreign policy of the Soviet Union. Memorandum of conversations, for example, uh, Nikita Khrushchev's conversations with foreign leaders. We, there are hundreds of them. Yeah, he was the sort of supremo in the USSR from mid-1950s to 1964. You've got hundreds of Nikita Sergeyevich's conversations with foreign leaders and various visitors, not just necessarily foreign leaders. The same also applies to Brezhnev. So there's a Brezhnev personal fund which has hundreds of his various speeches, conversations, his various interventions at the Politburo, God knows what. So you've got Brezhnev basically on record talking about stuff, whether it's domestic policy or a lot of it is foreign policy, day on a day-to-day -day basis. So what you can do now as a historian is you go back to the source evidence, and yes, some of it actually reinforces pre-existing conceptions about the Cold War and what we knew already about the Cold War, but there's also much that is new. There's new evidence on various aspects of the Cold War. And I can talk about some of the, some of the you know, findings that are, that are particularly interesting. But also what you get from this exercise of reading hundreds of conversations, um, hundreds and thousands of, you know, Stalin's various communications, his memos to Molotov, his letters, etc. What you get out of this is a unique psychological portrait of leaders that allows you to almost rewrite the history of the Cold War, or at least history of Soviet foreign policy during the Cold War, um, uh, in, in, in the form of some kind of a psychoanalysis. It, it is as if you're sitting there next to these people as they develop their views and recount their views about the world, and you really start seeing what drives them, what underpins their behavior, what is it that they want, what are their passions, what are their delusions. All of those things come to life in the, in the most spectacular way that could not be captured until now because we did not have access to these materials. So as a historian, I feel like a psychiatrist or psychologist or counselor, I don't know what you call that, but you're sitting there in the room, you're listening to these people recount the same stories over and over again, and you really start to understand what drives them. So this is a very personalistic uh, history. And it's so actually some years ago when I first started going down that road, I made a presentation about this book. And, and there was one, uh, one person in the audience who kind of sarcastically kind of said, well, you're just reviving the great man theory here. Why are you looking at this? You know, aren't there societal factors that are really important? Well, I'll tell you why this is important. We just saw a few weeks ago how one person acting on his delusions, misconceptions about the world, or maybe if frankly has gone off the rails and somewhere has a you know incorrect understanding of, of the world, or maybe he just lost in his in his uh, uh, in, in in his own visions and and uh, his own reading of history has unleashed a, a, a transformational war, transformational for Russia in a negative sense. Obviously, Russia is being transformed into something quite horrible and also for the world. So this just shows you the consequences of one person's actions, person, somebody who is given virtually unlimited powers and acting on his ambitions and his delusions can break, you know, it can break up a lot of stuff and create a lot of mess. So in this sense, I think this history of Soviet foreign policy actually very timely because I do that for every Soviet leader and I show how their particular paranoias, their delusions, their, their 
um, they're uh, often uh, uh, their their ego drives foreign policy in a way that you would not have expected. So with this, okay, let me go back to the basics. When we discuss the running of Soviet foreign policy, generally speaking, and you can find that in practically every book on the Cold War and Soviet foreign policy, generally speaking, the, uh, the Soviet foreign policy is, is presented as being underpinned by two important considerations. The first consideration is security. That is to say, uh, the Soviet leaders wanted, always were insecure about their power, and you can find different explanations, and Canon did, you know, connect that to some kind of almost uh, uh, geographical considerations or something buried in deep history, but you can find, you know, you can just say this is reasonable for powers to feel insecure, countries feel insecure. It's not a pretty particular Russian thing, a lot of people feel insecure about themselves. So you've got this sense of insecurity and the quest for security that the Russians feel like they have to satisfy by various means. But for example, in Stalin's time, this was, this was by establishing a zone of buffer states um, in Eastern Europe. So if you look at Stalin's foreign policy in Eastern Europe in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, you will see that he tried to establish buffer state. It's not the same as to say that he necessarily wanted to communize them. And we have fantastic work by Norman Neimark, for example, that shows that Stalin had no fixed blueprints. He didn't want to communize Eastern Europe, which just kind of happened by accident in many ways. Um, so this is this is one. So security is one. And of course, the other pillar, the explanatory pillar, is usually seen as ideology. So in this sense, in the, in the, in this, in the Soviet sense, this, this means uh, being driven by uh, a, 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 a universalist vision transforming the world into something else, you know, creating this communist society. Uh, and by its very nature, this ideology was seen as being as incompatible with capitalism. Therefore, um, uh, therefore, actually, a lot of historians have traditionally seen the Cold War as inevitable because they said, well, the Soviets, there was something very specific about the Soviets, and that is they were obsessed with crazy ideology and they wanted to turn the world communism. Therefore, there was no real permanent accommodation that was possible with them. Even if their immediate security needs were satisfied, they were still driven by crazy ideology. Therefore, they're responsible for the Cold War and you can only contain them. So that's, you know, that's how things, things were written about. So that is, those are the two basic pillars. And of course, um, uh, Vlad Zubok and, and, and Plushakov as early as um, 1996, I think is where the, when the, their book came out, combined those two in something called the revolutionary imperial paradigm where Stalin was you know, both driven by revolutionary instincts, but also by imperial instincts, which imperialism is a kind of seen as maybe an outgrowth of security concerns or insecurity. Uh, and the, together though, they were fused and they, they drove this very aggressive foreign policy. So that is, that, that is a kind of prevailing conception. And what I'm trying to do here in the base of this new materials, in addition to simply adding a lot of new evidence to things that we thought we knew about, I'm also trying to do something else and uh, add a new interpretive framework. Where does this interpretive framework come from? It comes from, uh, well, <clears throat> I would say it comes from Fukuyama. Fukuyama is, 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 is widely criticized by lots of people for misreading history. A lot of people who, by the way, never read his books, criticize him for the end of history, for claiming that history has ended. In fact, I think Fukuyama is a very very nuanced, very insightful writer. And although he got a lot of things wrong, he also got a lot of things right. And what you see, not just in the end of history, but in much of his work, you have, in much of his work, including this very recent little thing called identity, it is underpinned by the same kind of consideration. Um, and that is, that, that, that is uh, the quest for recognition. He argues that recognition is very important to people. Uh, he doesn't really talk about recognition at the level of nation states, but he talks about recognition as, as in people want to be recognized. It's just in us. And he traces it back to Plato, basically. 
Um, but I think Fukuyama, it's fair enough to say that Fukuyama's key insight about quest for recognition, the desire to be recognized, is, um, is traceable back to, to the German philosopher Hegel, uh, as interpreted in particular by Alexander Kozhev, the French Russian philosopher and political figure. So we have this kind of genealogy of uh, political thought and particularly that focus on recognition. By the way, in the book, I say almost nothing about this. So I'm explaining this so that you see where I'm coming from and where my uh, approach as a historian comes from. This is something very different from what I used to do. I used to have a very von Rankian approach to writing history, which is I used to go to the archives and I would see, oh, look at this document. Oh, how fun. Let's just tell a story on the basis of this document, what they tell me. And, you know, I would write a book on this basis and uh, it would actually become quite successful. And uh, now I reread this and I think, oh my God, because it's it seems like it doesn't it doesn't have core, you know, central idea. But, you know, with, with time my brain ossified a little bit and I've become very attached to concepts and I think um, using using concepts to tackle uh, historical evidence and to arrange historical evidence is actually quite helpful. Uh, not everybody will be satisfied. I'm sure my book will be trashed in, in, in reviews, uh, but it's going to make a point. And the point is uh, going again, growing on developing on, on Fukuyama slash Kozhev slash, uh, uh, slash Hegel. The, 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 the core, core argument is that uh, Soviet foreign policy can actually be explained in different way. And to explain it, I will use, um, I will use uh, a square. No, I'm not gonna use a square. I'm going to use a triangle. Okay, so I'm sure you have heard about this something called Maslow, Maslow's Triangle. Uh, Maslow's Triangle of, of Needs is how people self-actualize. Uh, and the argument goes that in order to self-actualize, you need to build on a foundation. So there's a foundation of the triangles right down here. And that is security. You need to have physical security. If, for example, we have a like we have now a war in Ukraine and people's livelihoods and lives are being threatened and people are being killed, you cannot self-actualize under those circumstances. All you need is physical survival. That is, you know, the basic bottom line. So once you need to have physical survival, is the bottom line here. Once you have achieved that, then you can build on that and you can achieve other things. And the uh, muscle triangles of Soviet foreign policy includes at the bottom, the need for security. I think that this still explains a lot of things. And those people who have argued the Soviet foreign policy is fundamentally underpinned by Soviet insecurity, I think are basically right. But if you build on, on top of this, then the question becomes, well, what else? What else? And um, uh, what, what I find exists here in the upper side of the triangle is the desire for recognition and desire for validation as a great power. That is core to Russian foreign policy, Soviet foreign policy in its own time as well. Um, and, and this question of recognition, by the way, is extremely interesting, extremely interesting. You need to be recognized by somebody who is greater than yourself. For example, if let's say the Soviets were recognized as a great power by let's say, I don't know, Angola. Angola is a fine country and they had a wonderful communist party leadership, NPLA leadership under Agustino Neto. But the fact that they recognized the Soviets for a leader of world revolution, that was, yeah, that was important at some level, but it was not as important as being recognized by the United States as the leader of the kind of you know imperialist world. So you have different types of recognition. You also have different audiences. So for the Soviets, the recognition that really mattered, there were different types of recognition. They also were contradictory often, but the recognition that really mattered first and foremost was recognition by the United States because the Soviets and today, I think the Russians saw the United States as a peer competitor and they wanted recognition of their greatness by their peer competitor, not by anybody else, but specifically by their peer competitor. The second kind of recognition that they wanted was recognition as the leader in the socialist camp. 
And that kind of recognition could be awarded by, by anybody in the, in the socialist camp, but, the, but who really mattered in this context were the Chinese, because the Chinese were also great power or socialist power. Therefore, the Soviets really cared about what the Chinese thought about them. They cared about this throughout the Cold War, especially cared under Nikita Khrushchev and actually many Soviet foreign policy moves, which are sometimes attributed to other factors can be explained with reference to the Soviet squad or Soviet um, uh, desire for being recognized for recognition by the Chinese. So that is another kind of recognition. So basically in the book, I look at how this issue of recognition played out and how it played into foreign policy decision making. Uh, so far, so good, but a question may be asked about it. So far, I have not said anything about ideology. And that is that is interesting because this is what for a vast majority, probably 100% minus one of Cold War historians, this is what defined the Cold War, that it was ideal and ideological competition between the East and the West. It was a it was a competition between the Soviet Union and the United States for the right path towards modernization because they both wanted to modernize. Of course, that's Arnie Westad's argument. Um, so ideology was always in Cold War studies was always seen as super prominent, what defined the Cold War, what was central to the Cold War, and so on and so forth. And this is how oh, Cold War history was written about in the 1990s. The, the end of history moment, to cite it again, uh, marked the death of communism. So therefore, after 1989, there was almost like a sense of um, uh, triumphalism in Cold War writing and the sense that, yeah, well, the Soviets were trying to build this world on the basis of a utopian idea and all of that fail, fell apart, but ideology was anyway central to uh, the paradigm. Again, you know, what would be Zubox and Plishakov's revolutionary imperial paradigm without revolution? It would be, it wouldn't work. So ideology is central, has been central, but not so much to my book. So in the book, I, I look at ideology and I, I recognize its role, but, uh, but I see that it played a secondary role for the Soviet leadership because ideology helped to legitimize their claims to power. So it, it, served, as, it served an instrumental purpose. Uh, it helped legitimize because you need to have, you cannot just claim power for power's sake. You need some kind of uh, legitimating framework to, to say that you, you deserve this power. Therefore, the Soviets had ideology and they would say for to their internal domestic audience that, well, we're bu building communism, therefore we deserve this power. And to the international audiences, we're building communism, therefore take it seriously. So that is the role of ideology in my book. Uh, but when you look specifically at various Cold War crises, and I do that um, throughout the book, uh, we find that actually the role played by specific ideological dogmas cannot be specifically pinpointed. They, it, it, the role is, it's, it's not as straightforward as a lot of people think. I'll give you a few examples, okay? And let's, let's, I've, I've got a few more minutes, so let's go to a few crises and a few, and, you know, discuss a few examples. Uh, the origins of the Cold War is an interesting one. Um, there's an opinion that Stalin saw the um, because he had ideological proclivities that he saw contradictions among Western powers as inevitable. And he also saw contradictions between the socialist and capitalist systems as inevitable. In other words, he saw war as inevitable. And that opinion is often framed ideologically. And this is where, if you read books about the origins of the Cold War, this is what people talk about. They say, well, Stalin had these ideas about the world, that war is inevitable, that there are in, in, inherent contradictions and so on. And this is very Marxist. This is a Marxist approach to the world. And I beg to disagree. Of course, Stalin would frame this as a Marxist, but it's not, you know, you do not have to be a Marxist to believe that great powers are going to have conflict among one another. Um, today, for example, we have a conflict between Russia on the one hand and the West, and uh, we don't have much communist ideology. 
and yet we still have conflict. So how does how do you explain that? Why is it that we still have conflict? What are we fighting about here? That is an interesting perspective, you know, an interesting question we have to ask. And by the way, in light of this recent developments, in light of the fact that we have continuation of conflict between Russia and the West, we have now we can now return to the Cold War and actually ask some of those probing questions. If the Cold War was all about ideology, then how come we still have this conflict now? You know what? How what explains this continuity? It's almost like it's not accident. There's a Soviet word called "not accidental," <laughs> Soviet diplomatic speak, and this is definitely not accidental. There's something else here. So, in other words, you can explain and uh, in Stalin in this case, and they're in the late say in the late 1940s with reference to uh, Thucydides, much as you can explain Stalin with reference to Karl Marx. Yeah, the uh, weak exact. Now they're rather the strong exact what they can and the weak grant what they must. Where does that come from? From the um, uh, dialogue of the Athenian, Athenian generals at the island of Melos in the Peloponnesian Wars. Would Stalin subscribe to this? A hundred percent. Is that a Marxist proposition? I don't know. You know, I don't know, but I can tell you that Stalin literally spoke in those exactly same, you know, if you read what he said or how he said, he would say those exact words. By the way, Brezhnev as well, uh, in, in many instances, I would find them talk about, you know, say things like, oh, uh, or, you know, Khrushchev as well, uh, the, the Americans only understand the language of force. And you see that again and again and again from Stalin to Khrushchev to Brezhnev to Putin today. There's a remarkable continuity. Is that Marxism or is it just realism? That's an interesting question that just begs asking or being asked. So, of course, you know, people will critique this and say, well, but you don't understand ideology. And ideology actually is a kind of a lens that defines who you see as an enemy, et cetera. And I understand there's a, it's actually wide field. And uh, I, people will complain about my approach to ideology and I will receive bitter criticism in, in reviews, which I don't care about at this point. Uh, I cared about it when I was younger, but now that I'm an established historian, yeah, okay, 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 fine. Of course, yes, I deeply care, if, especially if I see that it's smart critique. If I see this, yeah, it goes to the heart of my, of my struggle with the concept of ideology. And I have been, con uh, I've been struggling with that concept of ideology, the meaning of ideology, the meaning of worldview, the meaning of recognition for years and years and years. And I find that those are extremely slippery, extremely difficult concepts. So yes, I am waiting for uh, bad reviews as it were and depending on how penetrating they are I will either embrace them and say Wes yes you're right but I insist on my own point of view or I will say okay you don't know what you're talking about so um uh, so that is, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about Stalin a little bit, the origins of the Cold War. I find with, with Stalin, the origins of the Cold War, one thing that I find very, very interesting, and, and this has actually been highlighted by some historians already, is just how much Stalin hoped for post-war cooperation with the West. Um, he did not intend to have a Cold War. He hoped for division of the world into spheres of influence. He hoped that his sphere of influence would be recognized and respected, and therefore he was actually willing to moderate his behavior in many instances. In other words, you would think, well, Stalin was such a realist, therefore, where he had force, he would just say, this is mine. What's mine is mine. What's yours is up for negotiation. Um, he didn't do that. In many instances, he did not do that. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, the example of the Greek Revolution is, is a very well-known one. So the Greeks, um, after the Second World War, actually, as the, cold, the Second World War was coming to an end, there was a communist uprising in Greece in uh, December 1944 that was brutally suppressed by the British. But then there was basically a uh, kind of a revolution slash civil war going on th throughout Greece. And uh, the Greek communists requested Stalin to provide them with help. He refused. You know when he started providing them with help? In 1947, in fact, in May 1947. And that is already after many things, including the uh, Iron Curtain speech and, you know, you name it, uh, the Truman Doctrine uh, in, 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 in March 1947. So it was a gradual buildup by, I guess, uh, mid-1947, Stalin decided that there, that 
the Cold War was already happening and he was going to he was going to go with this. So Greece is an interesting example. Why is it that he didn't want to support uh, the communist revolution in Greece? That is because he had obviously uh, the uh, agreement with Churchill called the percentages agreement concluded when Churchill was in Moscow in October 1950, uh, 1944, in which there was a division of um, uh, spheres of influence in Southeastern Europe and um, and there was, um, uh, you know, I think in Greece, I think it was 90% British and 10% Soviets, which didn't mean anything. In Yugoslavia, it was 50-50. By the way, one interesting, I, I mentioned to you that I would, I mentioned a few anecdotes of that, some new evidence about um, uh, some ver various different aspects of the Cold War. The percentages agreement is an interesting one because now that we have more evidence on how it was negotiated, we see that the Soviets took it extremely, extremely seriously. Would you believe that outside of that meeting between Churchill and Stalin, when of course Churchill famously wrote down the percentages and gave it to Stalin, and Stalin did a big fat tick mark, gave it back to Churchill and said, and Churchill said, shall we burn it? And Stalin, no, you keep it. Stalin, and, and then of course, that's why we have it in, the, in the, the, the original in the Churchill archives. Well, after this meeting, there were actually series of meetings, including Molotov, uh, involving Molotov and Eden, uh, the foreign secretary, in which you would not believe it, they bargained about specific percentages in specific countries like Hungary, uh, whether it should be 75% or, you know, 80% or 77.5%. And you read it, you think, are these people for real? I mean, how do you even define this kind of influence? And something something point something percent it's ridiculous but there we go they were actually doing this so that it actually suggests the soviets really took it seriously which is why stalin decided not to support greek communists early on in the conflict actually was quite happy to sell them out uh, another person who is, he was quite happy to sell out was comrade Mao Zedong, who in 1945 uh, realized that the time was on his side, favored uh, the CCP, and he was willing to start a civil war in China. August 1945, there comes a telegram from Stalin say, saying, go to Chongqing, the wartime capital of China, negotiate peace and coalition government with Chiang Kai-shek. And, and Mao was, of course, outraged by this. Like, what, what, how? You know, he was also, he didn't want to go because he thought the Chiang Kai-shek would order the plane shot down. He did go in the end. And there was a negotiation which didn't go anywhere, but not for Stalin's lack of trying. And Stalin certainly tried to do that. And he also brought to, he betrayed, uh, there was an a insurgency in Xinjiang where uh, the Uyghurs were basically trying to oust the Chinese and they were winning with Stalin's support. They actually were, com were completely victorious. By 1945, Stalin betrayed the insurgency, say to hell with you actually. Uh, our, we need to have our relationship with Chiang Kai-shek. Why is the relation with Chiang Kai-shek so important, more important than Mao Zedong and the Uy Uyghur insurgency? That is because the relation with Chiang Kai-shek was regulated by the 1945 Sino-Soviet Treaty of Alliance, which in turn was um, underpinned by the Yalta Agreement. So in this case, Stalin could have pushed further, he could have bufferized northern China, he could have had a warlord in Xinjiang, you know, Mao Zedong in Yanang, he could have had, I don't know, somebody else in Mongolia, Cho Bolsan was pushing him to extend over to inner Mongolia. Stalin didn't do any of those things. Why? Because he wanted, he valued American recognition of the gains he already had in the framework of the Yalta Agreement. So Yalta framework becomes very important and only falls apart really starting from 1947. Between 1947 and 49, the Yalta framework starts to fall apart and Stalin realizes that he has to put all his eggs in one basket that is in, in the basket of communist revolutions where he could impose himself. So that is that is an interesting story about the origins of the Cold War and how even Stalin, even Stalin, for all his belief in Machiavellian use of force, how he also valued American recognition because it gave his gains legitimacy. Because power without legitimacy is just power, but you also want legitimacy. That is one of the big takeaways of the book, I suppose. Okay, uh, I, I have many other um, interesting examples um, about, about various aspects of the Cold War. And I see that we're almost starting to run out of time. So maybe it's time to pause and switch over to, to uh, questions, Q&A, and then maybe I can, um, I can talk more about various other examples. Tatiana, what do you think?
Yeah, let's do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, yeah, the, I have questions and I'm sure the audience have um, a lot of questions. So I think the chat box should be open and um, otherwise you can also um, uh, raise your hand and um, ask your question. Uh, while we are waiting for, oh yes, that is the first one, but um, I will use my uh, position and ask my first question. Um, so as a, just a, as, as out of curiosity, so your background is in the East Asian um, history, China and Mongolia. Um, do you think like that background influenced your approach? Um, do you do like anything that you bring um, from your background and academic background uh, to the to your new turn? Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, it's it's definitely strength because this field of Cold War studies is, is, has been long um, overwhelmed, I guess, by by people who are mainly folk who are who are mainly focused on Soviet American relations and Russian American relations, and there is much less of expertise with regard to China and Russian a Russian or Soviet. Asia policy, um, never mind Mongolia, you know, Mongolia, of course, I, 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 Mongolia does come up quite a lot in my early, uh, in the early discussion in my book, uh, because I feel that I've got something interesting to say. And of course, I can draw on Mongolian sources, which is, which is also useful. Um, but yeah, there are very few people, of course, Arnie Westad is a major ex exception to the rule. Of course, he's, he's the, the big, uh, the major Cold War historian, he, he gets China very, very well. Uh, he's fantastic, a fantastic historian of China. So I wouldn't say that I'm in any kind of, you know, in any shape or form, the only person who does that. But I do feel that it's a, in relative terms, there are few people who can talk about Russian foreign policy and bring China into the equation. There are a few, and, and I'm one of them, I'm happy to be one of them. Yeah, as a, as a historian of Japan, of uh, Imperial Japan, there are so many things that are kind of given for me um or people who study imperial japan that you know the defense security um ideology is kind of a secondary element or um you know the kind of the quest for recognition that that that's um was all very kind of uh present and this is kind of a main framework to understand imperial japan as well um sure sure yeah, yeah. And, and 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 even people who write about Russia today, for example, um, I'm thinking of Andrei Tsigankov, for example, some other people do actually deploy the same framework uh, in this question of recognition, prestige, state, as you call it, different names. But uh, it, it is actually central to a lot of emerging literature, uh, not so much Cold War history, though, where, which is still kind of preoccupied with the battle between ca capitalism and communism. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, let's open the floor. So I think the first question is by Jim Dingeman. Yes, thank you. Um, I had uh, one, actually two questions. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting. And I wanted to ask you, what have you discovered about the impact of the second front issue in 1941 through 1944 that would be new? that uh, has to do with uh, exacerbating uh, tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. And then also, how do you see what we're going through right now uh, in terms of a continuation of these kind of ideas? Is this, uh, uh, what are the connections between Ravangist ultra-nationalist thinking in Russia today with what you've looked at in the past in terms of the Soviet Union? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, on, on the question of the second front, uh, obviously, it, uh, the uh, Western failure to open the second front uh, was, uh, or time in time of fashion, was uh, taken by Stalin, who was a very cynical character as, as an example of uh, Western duplicity. And it was one of many examples of such duplicity that he interpreted as duplicity. Uh, uh, um, another example is the failure to inform him about the uh, about the Manhattan Project, which of course he knew everything about through espionage. 
So that is yes, uh, that, but you know, that doesn't mean that if let's say Stalin was that if the Western allies were kinder towards Stalin that he would act more kindly towards them. That is actually an interesting issue that I face not just with Stalin but with various other Soviet leaders. Um, uh, for example, even Gorbachev, I, I talk about, I've, I've got a few chapters about Gorbachev and uh, I talk about the fact that basically uh, in, by 1989, it was very clear that Gorbachev was, that the Soviet Union was losing the Cold War. And then of course you have George, uh, uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, acting in a fairly, I would say, unceremonious fashion in terms of like kicking the Soviet Union out of Europe um, in, in terms of preserving NATO structures, in terms of uh, kind of pushing the Soviet Union out. And, you know, there was this memorable conversation between um, Bush and Cole in which uh, Bush said, Cole was trying to figure out whether or not to uh, concede to Gorbachev on some of the demands that Gorbachev had about uh, United Germany staying out of NATO. And Bush told him, why would you allow Gorbachev to snatch victory out of, out of jaws of defeat? And when I, when I look, you know, I recount those stories and then I basically say, well, but what would the Soviets have done in this sort of situation? What, the so what would the Soviets have done if let's say the Americans were losing the Cold War and everybody was asking to join the Warsaw Pact and the Americans are like, oh no, keep, let us, let us be, you know, let's uh, dismantle the Warsaw Pact and we still want to, you know, we want peace and, uh, and, 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 and general security for everyone. And the Soviets would not have been very kind to vanquished foe. So in this sense, Gorbachev uh, should not be surprised and of course, if Stalin had an opportunity back in the 1940s to screw the United States, he would have done it with relish. Uh, so, so my understanding of the fact that Stalin was very cynical um, and uh, uh, saw the Western allies as, as trying to undercut him in no way actually uh, undermines my conviction that it, it was okay to do that actually to undercut him because he would have done the same thing. So that is that is the uh, sorry it's a long winded answer to the first part of your question. And the second part of your question, Jim, concerns um, what are you know what are the continuities and between the Cold War and the present, if I may reframe it in those in, in those terms. And there are certain continuities and also there are certain differences. So obviously the obvious difference, the, the elephant in the room that is no longer there is the absence of communist ideology, uh, which was which served a rationalizing, legitimizing pur purpose during the Cold War. So that actually, that elephant died by various accounts in the 1970s or in the 1980s. Anyway, it collapsed. Ideology was no longer there. And that actually is one of Russia's tragedies because Russia, after it uh, established itself as independent from the Soviet Union in 1991, it never, uh, it never managed to develop a workable, a viable ideology. Um, and this gap, this void was filled by toxic nationalism that is actually in some ways every bit as dangerous and perhaps even more dangerous than the communist ideology because it has very very clear fascist overtones so what we see today in ukraine playing out is actually uh, uh is is actually manifestation of this it's the manifestation of you know it's it's a manifestation of russia's uh, newly found imperial imperial identity um it's and it's a big tragedy so that is that is the difference uh, with the past, but there are also important similarities. And the similarities, first of all, concern that desire to be recognized. Uh, that is very interesting. And, and that you can see that throughout, even after Russia, after the Soviet Union collapsed, you see a Russian leader, uh, Boris Yeltsin, still try to, you know, he was still trying to gain some sort of um, <clears throat> status as the next in importance to the United States. And the whole Russian foreign policy pursued by Andrei Kozarev in the early 1990s was actually targeted at tying Russia to the United States in a way gaining American recognition as 
as key partner and and getting your greatness from that so russia still wanted to have that in the 90s but then it, it realized gradually and by it i mean specific political leaders and certainly uh, starting from yeltsin in the mid 1990s but increasingly with vladimir putin realized that that it was not being recognized for the partner that it saw itself as for the great uh, you know for for uh, it, it was not able to create some sort of a condominium with the United States to run the world. Um, and um, uh, and so it still it still wanted recognition, but increasingly this recognition became a recognition not as America's key partner, but as America's key adversary, because you could still derive legitimacy from being recognized as a key adversary, much as you can derive legitimacy from being recognized as the key partner. So if you look at Russia's domestic legitimation narratives today, Obviously, America is presented as, as, as the great Satan and the great enemy, um, but, uh, and of course, obviously, Russia is being recognized by the United States now as the great Satan and the great enemy. And that recognition, oddly enough, underpins Russia's legitimacy narrative domestically. So uh, th this is a weird thing about recognition. It just and, and actually, this contradiction is something I face in the book. After I'm trying to figure it out, and I don't know if I'll be able to do it entirely. But um, but when we talk about recognition, the question becomes not just recognition by who, but recognition is what. Recognition is a great power. Recognition as a partner. Recognition as a, a recognition as an adversary. Recognition as all of those things. It's 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 a little bit unclear. So that's that's a serious hole in my argument. Um, now, the final thing that is a continuity from the Cold War and carry over to the present is obviously the presence of nuclear weapons that, it, that, that has completely redefined the, the landscape of international politics. So when people today, among historians as well, say that, oh, you know, today is very different from the Cold War and it's much more like great power politics of the First World War and preceding the First World War, you know, my answer to them is you are kidding yourselves. This is so different because there was a huge shift in international politics and global politics with the nuclear revolution in the 1950s. It is just not the period preceding the First World War. We're do, we are much more in a much greater continuum, continuation with the Cold War than we are with the politics of great powers preceding that, uh, the, the invention of nuclear weapons. So, sorry, long-winded answers, but those, those uh, I hope yeah. They, 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 yeah, touch on the key have, points. We have many questions, and we also have questions about the nuclear wars and, and I, so I, on. Apolog I apologize. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> um, so we have like uh, 40 minutes left. Let's try to answer um, all the questions. I think Ilham, you posted it in the chat box, but you also have your hand raised. Would you like to speak? Yes. Yes, yes. I'm just one, just quick question. Like, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Sergey, like, did you think that Russia's foreign policy? has always been revisionist because like uh, it is very nice insight when you talk about the Soviet period, uh, they just uh, seeking for the great recognition like, and also there has been a pattern of the revisionist in their uh, Soviet foreign policy and also in the Russian foreign policy. But like uh, for the today situation, like did you think that this uh, the Russia foreign policy has always been this revisionist, as same as the Soviet foreign policy, and maybe goes trace back in the imperial Russia. Uh, thank you so much. You know, um, thank you for this question. Um, I think that that the the current revisionism of of Russian foreign policy is a is a is a carryover from from the sense that that the Russians unfairly lost their status at the end of the Cold War, because not because they, they were at the helm of a, of a bankrupt system, but because of some kind of a uh, treason somewhere or you know weak leadership on the part of Gorbachev or something like this. So uh, this revisionism aims at restoring Russia's former greatness. So in a sense, it drives back at this question of being recognized as, as, a, as a very, very, you know, great and unique power, et cetera. Um, and uh, it, it, it is, um, uh, in many ways, it's, it's, um, it's similar to German revisionism uh, in the interwar period, right? It's not, it's not all that different. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> 
Um, all right, um, next is Rashid. Uh, so thanks a lot, Sergey, for, for that talk. That was very, very interesting. Um, you and I actually happen to know Anatole Levin in common. And uh, back in 2003 or 2004 at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, I had a conversation with him uh, on, uh, well, one of a series of conversations. But in any case, his argument consistently has been for a long time that Russia uh, sort of needs and deserves the recognition of, um, of a sphere of influence, which is similar to, you know, of course, what you were saying uh, regarding, you know, what, what Stalin wanted and demanded. And then in response to Jim's question, you, are, you, you, you basically said that Russia still, you know, under Putin wants uh, something similar and even wanted it. Um, I suppose to some extent under under Yeltsin. Uh, now, I guess my question to you is: To what ex? I mean, can can Putin uh, in in any possible world uh, be satisfied with something less than a sphere of influence? Given that uh, other than Lukashenko, nobody wants to be in his sphere of influence. Uh, and then, secondly, uh, if. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if 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 uh, there's no way to dissuade uh, you know modern day Russia from its pursuit of a sphere of influence, uh, no matter what the means are, uh, then is there a way uh, to create a situation in which uh, Putin will be satisfied with a Ukraine that is anything less than a puppet? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rashid. Um, uh, you know this this quest for recognition and and. I guess wishing Russia to be great is not confined to um, Putin, uh, and I would you know I would argue that it's actually a sense shared by a lot of people even on the liberal spectrum, and so of you know the liberal Russian intelligentsia, where the disagreement is is how to go about attaining this attaining this kind of recognition, attaining perhaps some kind of sphere or something like that. Uh, and uh, here in a very important, a very important disagreement because uh, from Stalin to Putin, you have uh, a series of leaders who feel like they are owed something that they need to have a sphere and that are you, they're willing to use very cynically to use force, much as the Athenian generals at Melos, they're using, they're willing to use force to uh, impose their sphere of influence. Now, they may be successful in the short term, but it, they are in success, non successful in the long term. Uh, so, for example, the Soviets imposed their sphere on Hungary in 1956 when the Hungarians said, we've had enough of this, we, we want to rebel. The Soviets introduced, they send their tanks and crush the Hungarian revolutionaries. Uh, the West didn't do anything, by the way. And uh, the same thing um, happened in 1968 uh, with the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Again, the Soviets felt they they owed the you know they 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 were owed the Czechoslovakia. There was this this was their sphere, and they were willing to use force. But of course, the long term consequences of this were uh, both the Hungarians and the Czechoslovaks did not learn to love the Russians very much. They there was no love lost between them, and as soon as the opportunity uh, came up to escape the this Russian uh, sphere, they did so with 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 just. Uh, great willingness in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Now, when we come to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, I think in a way his invasion of Ukraine was underpinned by a similar cal calculation that the invasion of Hungary and Czechoslovakia in the sense that he already saw Ukraine as part of the Russia, of, of Russian sphere of influence. Therefore, he expected the West not to do anything about it, like they didn't do anything about Hungary and Czechoslovakia in 56 and 68. And in a sense, he was right. He was right. And although there was a great reaction in the West, you know, solidarity, outrage, economic sanctions, he miscalculated there, of course. Uh, and there's been bitter resistance by the Ukrainians. In the broader scheme of things, he was right in the sense that there was no Western intervention in the war because in the end, NATO doesn't want to get involved in fighting the Russians over Ukraine. It's kind of already implicitly assigned to uh, a gray zone, if not outright Russian sphere. So that is that is uh, you know that uh, that is that. But then 
the problem that he faces is very similar once again to the problem the Soviets faced in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. That is, if you pose yourself by force, people are not going to like you. This is not going. This is not a sustainable solution. Okay, even if you manage to hold on to file, you know, fraction of Ukraine or Donbass or something, and you know, obviously he wanted to overthrow the government and he failed to do that in the first days of war. But now he's obviously trying to partition Ukraine. Okay, you hold on to your partition. Is that going to? Is that a viable basis for long-term winning friends uh, and, and influencing people? To use Carnegie's phrase. This is not a viable way to do that. And this is where we have a different kind of methodology of people who are more on the liberal side of the spectrum who are saying, OK, we recognize the fact that Russia, OK, we can say that Russia is some kind of a great power and doesn't deserve to be great power or not. It doesn't matter. It's not OK. We want Russia to be a respected player on the international um, in the in international order and exercise its, its influence beyond its borders, just not in this kind of way. Russia should focus on making itself more attractive so that others see it as a model and then they will they will not try to run away from Russia they will try to embrace Russia and build closer relations with them and say ah, you know those people on the right side of the spectrum in Russia will say this is naive and and idiotic because uh, you know people in Eastern Europe will never like Russia except if they're forced to like Russia but those of us who are more liberal are saying come on this is ridiculous what Russia really needs is it needs to focus on making Making itself a viable society, open, attractive, to, you know, to, to invent itself as something other than a hideous imperialist reincarnation, which is what it has become since the 1990s. And this debate, unfortunately, has been won for now by the hideous imperialists. So this is where we find ourselves. Um, but uh, uh, but you know, so so will what will happen now is obviously so much is tied to Putin. Will Russia ever be satisfied with anything? You know, again, it's very difficult to say because so much is tied to this one person. Uh, Russia is very personalistic uh, society, and the power structure is power vertical is very personalistic. Therefore, one person can make all this. Uh, can upend the entire order. And once Putin is out of the picture, I think we will have another, uh, we'll have a, a period of reassessment of what Russia really wants, what Russia can do, what, or the, what Russia may be allowed to do, because Russia is not the only actor here. There are Eastern European powers that also, and players that also want the, to be recognized as something, as not just puppets of Russia. So therefore, uh, some kind of balance will have to be to be struck, and I uh, and as uh, obviously as a Russian, well, I, I, I'm, I'm I'm Russian Ukrainian to be you know to be frank. So I'm kind of straddling this, but I, I hope in the long term Russia will learn to to live with its neighbors and and and, and stop trying to dominate them. Uh, being I, I I find that 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 recognition of greatness. Uh, does not necessarily have to stem from imperial control of your neighboring people. Uh, greatness can be can be uh, reinterpreted and reinvented as 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 a quality of life for your own people. You know that that is what Russia should focus for instead of imperial imperial control and spheres of influence. Right. Thanks a lot, Sergey. As a Belarusian citizen, I'm very happy to hear your answer. Thanks. Hopefully, it'll go in that direction. Mm. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, thank you, Rashid. Um, so the question is, okay, from the chat box, Nathan, um, it's about, uh, uh, was there any collaboration between Mao Zedong and Stalin on uh, nuclear use in war and warfare? Uh, sorry, uh, in war and warfare? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> nuclear, uh, no. nuclear, about the nuclear use. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, obviously, the Sino-Soviet alliance of 1950 extended Soviet nuclear umbrella over China, but the Soviets did not start helping the Chinese nuclear program and did not um, uh, did not offer any expertise until uh, until 1956. In 1956, they started helping big time. 1957, they signed um, uh, even an agreement with China to transfer a sample nuclear bomb to China, an agreement that they subsequently canceled in 1959. So uh, under Khrushchev, 
the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Sino-Soviet nuclear collaboration grew very close, and Khrushchev later regretted this and thought it was a bad idea. But for a time, he was so enthusiastic about China and was willing to give them the bomb. Um, but beyond that, no, there was no real uh, coordination between them. All right. Um, so, question from Timothy. Um, thank you for the talk. Dr. Achenko, my question What do you think are the prospects for the field of Cold War studies and Soviet history following the Russian invasion of Ukraine? How do you think about training undergraduates and graduate students in working with archival materials between the new materials released in the late 2010s, early 20s, and researchers' inability to access archives in Russia for the foreseeable future? That's my question too. <laughs> yeah, that is an that is extremely important, very interesting question. And isn't that remarkably ironic? Then just as the Russians declassify all this material, so you can write endless dissertations on Russian history now by going to Moscow and going to Gaspi or Ganyo and any of those places. Just as this happens, uh, you have this kind of deterioration in relations. So now it is it is uh, almost unthinkable for researchers to go. Well, it's not entirely unthinkable, but it's very it's it's becoming a very unfriendly and welcoming place. And there are all kinds of logistical difficulties as well. And I can say that even myself, as a Russian, you know, I was in Moscow in January, and I was still working in the archives in a great time. Would I go now? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's becoming, it's a difficult call to make because it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a big fish. I'm a small fish, but people know that I'm not a great fan of, 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 of the Tsar. And uh, uh, so therefore, you know, there are also risks involved even for people like me. So I expect the uh, volume of uh, uh, research to decline despite the greater openness of materials. And that's just a fact that's going to happen. And it's actually lamentable because one of the things that we see that we urgently need to remedy is the lack of expertise in things Russian and kind of Eastern European in certainly in the West and certainly in the United States. We know that for years um, in the run-up to this invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we had decrease in funding available to researchers, not least to the State Department, for example, link language training. Is that a good idea? Of course, it's a bad idea. I mean, look, now, you know, what are we, how are we to understand Russia? How, to, how are we to figure out what to do in the, in, in the future? I mean, Russia will continue to be a grave challenge, no matter how things go. You, we need to have expertise, and we just don't have it. So building expertise um, is, is going to be a challenge. Linguistic training is probably less of a challenge now. But yes, access to the archives is going to be a challenge for a com completely un unexpected reason, as it were, and not because they're closed, but because just nobody wants to go to Moscow anymore uh, and risk it. So what are we going to do? I don't know, Tim, you tell me what what uh, what what should we do at this stage? Um, all right. <laughs> um, OK, so I have a, a, a question that was sent to me as a direct message. Um, so it's a kind of um, sort of inspired by the recent uh, article by Kotkin. Um, have you read it? You mean his interview in New Yorker? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, that was an interview, right? Um, uh -huh. Yes, yeah, yeah. In, yeah, New Yorker. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, um, as a pre-revolutionary Russian historian, distressed by essentialist interpretations of Russian foreign policy. Can you briefly comment? And, you know, thinking about Kotkin's um, interview, can you briefly comment on continuity before and after 1917 within your framework, how you would understand continuity or discontinuity between um, yeah, well, yeah, 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 and, and Soviet Russia? No, of course. Yeah, there is a lot of continuity. And that is the whole point of uh, breaking up Russian history into this period, the Cold War, uh, some, you know, can we almost a unique exceptional event or uh, Tsarist Russia. I mean, fundamentally, Russian foreign policy, Soviet foreign policy, Tsarist foreign policy, they are all explainable with reference to some of those things that I talked about, namely the desire for security and the desire for greatness and the recognition of this greatness. 
uh, they are also explainable with reference to the kind of decision making that led repeatedly to horrible mistakes. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we can see that. So, for example, today we can talk about Putin's delusions with regard to Ukraine, with reference to, let's say, you know, Soviet decision making and their blunders, for example, in, in relation to Afghanistan in 1979. Or we can talk about um, the Crimean War and Nicholas I as being a very interesting precedent. And again, you know, there's a lot of continuity. That is the whole point of, of my approach. Now, in my book, however, and yes, Kotkin, <clears throat> Kotkin, of course, has a kind of a wider span of history and kind of goes into you know, all, all ancient Russian history. It, frankly, you can, you can go to ancient Russian history and you can find anything to explain anything today. And actually, I admire Kotkin. I think he's great. He's fantastic. The interview was just absolutely spot on. So do not construe that as criticism of Kotkin's take. Um, but I don't do that. So I do not... You know, I'm not going to go in my uh, in my uh, book and say, well, you know, what uh, Catherine the Great did is going to kind of explain what uh, uh, what the Russians are doing now. I'm not going to do that. But I do have this this business of of you know, I'm just talking about the Cold War basically. So this is my particular focus. Um, don't you know? Don't attempt much more. But but one thing that I did want to emphasize in this connection is. Um, I find, and I actually alluded that in early on in my talk, I find that this desire for recognition, there's nothing exceptional about it. There's nothing exceptional. It's just the way it played out in Russian history is very particular. But in, in theory, it's not exceptional. The Russians have it, the Chinese have it. Actually, several chapters of my book deal with Sino-Soviet relations. And what you'll see there is that there's Chinese desire to be recognized by the Russians. And it's so central to the Sino-Soviet split, the desire to be recognized and the Soviets denying this recognition to China. So for China, it matters the same kind of ways it matters for Russia. And I can even push, you, push this argument further and say that it actually matters for the United States. The United States also wants to be recognized. And if you are, if you spend enough time in the quote unquote blob in Washington, you will see how this idea of promoting America as a superpower and insisting that America has a God-given right to be superpower is actually, you know, underpins the entire foreign policy discourse of the US foreign policy establishment. It is just there. So this is the same ideas. And I think Fukuyama does, does it very well. He captures this as simply part of human nature. So it's, it, this is where the continuity is. So I, I veered off in various directions, but I hope, I hope you get my point. OK. Um, so please, um, if you have questions, please uh, keep posting them. Um, all right, so the next question is about China. Is there, from Christina, um, is there a possibility the model of autocracy of China and Russia will be seen as a role model by governments? Could it create crack in perceived democracies? Well, so this is a, 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 a highly debated issue. Um, first of all, China and Russia have very different models. Let's just start with that. They have super, superficial uh, similarities in the sense that the, the guy at the top exercises virtual and limited power. It's probably more unlimited in Russia's case because there are no institutional constraints, much more so uh, than in, in China's case. Uh, but in many other ways, the, the, these two countries are run in still very different ways. I mean, and even institutionally, you have a different kind of institutional setup in, in Russian politics. I mean, the Chinese institutional setup was very much a carryover from communist uh, system, Leninist system of setting up a government where you have you know, party, ruling party, plenums, Congress's plenums, uh, Central Committee, uh, Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee. So there's, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a different system as it were. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, its attractiveness, I mean, they may be attractive for different reasons to different audiences. So 
but but the Chinese, for example, have been very careful to argue that actually they don't see their system being exportable to uh, anywhere else. And they're right. They're right in this, in the sense that there is a unique system and try to export the system and set up a central committee in, I don't know, in Sri Lanka. This is not going to work. This is, you know, this is a recipe for disaster. So that's why the Chinese, even as they extend their economic clout and economic influence, they have been saying we're not exporting our political model. And I totally believe them. They actually are not exporting their political model because their political model is not exportable. With the Russians, it's a less of a model. I mean, what do you have? You have an interesting, you have elements of this. You have a personalistic rule by an autocrat, a corrupt autocrat. That is actually a model that is not uniquely Russian. I mean, look at Orban, Viktor Orban in Hungary. He's a little Putin of Hungary. You know, the, he runs... He, he runs by very similar, he's constrained by the European Union. There are external institutional constraints upon Orban, but basically this vile populism that Putin has, 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 uh, has um, been so successful with is exactly the kind of thing that Orban does. Who is borrowing from whom here? I mean, they are kind of contemporaneous. They are simultaneous. So I wouldn't see that as a necessarily an export of Russian system. It's just some kind of a populist system, corrupt, corrupt populist system that exists um, so uh, uh, so yeah so that I think would be my my answer I would not say I would not see as uh, uh, Russia and China exporting a anything together definitely not in terms of specific in its specific elements of let's say the Russian system it's not even exporting them but we do find them around the world Okay, um, are there any other questions? I have a question about archives. I, a um, few weeks ago, I hosted um, uh, Jonathan Haslam and uh, he talked about his new book about Second World War. Um, mm -hmm. And he also mentioned this, um, you know, the, the archives that were open in the late 2010s. Um, is there a uh, just simple question? <laughs> um, what was the reason why suddenly the archives became so available? What was behind that? What is the motive for opening the archives? Well, it's, you know, I don't want to engage in conspiracy theories here. I think it's just a fact that, I mean, there is a declassification process. There's a committee uh, that, spear, that, that runs this process. And this committee was taking requests from the various institutes, from the archives themselves. They want to declassify this material and make it available as part of their part of their job. So they would submit those requests and, and there would be the committee would consider them and they would declassify simply large chunks of materials uh, almost without, I think probably in, in some instances without reading much. So, uh, so I don't see it as a kind of a politically motivated. If you were to find a political angle in this thing, it, it is perhaps Putin's amateur interest in history. Uh, it seems that both Putin and Narishkin, of course, Narishkin is the head of uh, external intelligence, but also is the head of that society, whatever it's called, I forget, the, you know, the society of, uh, of correct interpretation of history or something, you know, I'm making it up, but, you know, he's got some kind of a society. Um, uh, so, you know, there's obviously interest in history there, and Putin has been shown with stacks of documents running around and write, writing his own historical articles about the Second World War for the national interest and stuff like that. So I think that that sort of attitude at the top contributes to uh, realization at the at the in mid level is that you could actually helpfully engage in declassification because that actually supports historical research and those up above they are saying that they're interested in historical research and they all also claim that everything is declassified in the west well we'll show the west that we are an open society compared to them and we'll declassify stuff so uh, so this process has begun i would not say that it's nearly even complete complete but there has been um, so in some arch some archives have been more affected than others. So Ghani, for example, now is an absolute treasure trove. Not only have they declassified their vast, vast materials, absolutely vast materials, but they even have an online finding aid where you can even access from your home in New York or something. You know, you can log on and see what they have there. It's very detailed. Uh, 
uh, and you can order, and then you can, if you can, you know, then dare to show up in Russia, then all the power to you, they'll give these materials to you. Uh, and also they allow you to take photocopy to, uh, to use your camera, which has vastly simplified the process of taking documents out because in the past you would have to write things down with your hand and uh, it was ridiculous, but then there was, and this is totally okay, this is an un-Russian story, but I think that just shows that how Russia is a much more complicated place than a lot of people think about, but there was a point where one uh, historian decided to sue the archives saying they had no right to ban cameras and would you believe it it went to the court and the court ruled in favor of that historian and since that Ragani or Gaspi both of those archives have been open to historians using their telephones to take you know images of documents a revolution in archival work so I have um, you know made full advantage of, 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 of this of this revolution uh, and uh, yeah but okay so on the positive side uh, and also going back to a question that Tim has asked it has to be said that a lot of materials uh, from the Stalinist era for example are available online and are not nearly fully mined by historians I will draw your attention to just two sources first of all Stalin's personal fund, thousands and thousands of documents have been uploaded and you can actually access them free of charge on the website called, um, I'll put it in the chat, in the chat uh, function, hang on. Uh, there it goes. So <clears throat> this website here, you can click on there and you can see Stalin's fund and also lots of other things. Uh, and then there's another one, which is still up, and it's great, I'm sure, for Haslam, uh, because it's the materials of Russian foreign ministry for the years of the Second World War have been scanned in their entirety for particular referenturas and put online, and this is called uh, this. Oops, no, not this. This is autocorrect. Stop autocorrecting me. So if you go there, you'll see that uh, there's a there's a huge amount of materials, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of documents. Uh, and also, given today the availability of new technology, like for example Google Lens, which you can literally just use your phone and you can actually see translations of documents, as you kind of if, you know even the knowledge. Uh, I'll say the knowledge of Russian is still crucial and hugely important, but it's no longer the kind of obstacle that. It used to be in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, that's uh, great references. Um, I was just copying them. Um, so we have a question uh, from Leah, and I guess it's a question about this um, big man in history and um, how we can, um, what role do values play in foreign policy decision making? How can historians account for irrational factors in one's choices? Um, and it seems that autocrats view the conflict with the best as clash of values and their choices as assertion of their agency to define their own values rather than the so-called universal values of democracy and human rights. How do you convince someone that your values are better without resorting to force? And then this question is, uh, does the underlying logic of universalism and exclusivity on the flip side behind monotheistic religions play any role here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very deep question. So with so many different angles here, I'll just focus on values. Um, so values are important for uh, who we are. In other words, values are an hugely important contributing factor to our uh, sense of identity. And when you look at those leaders, I mentioned that when you read all those documents and the memorandum of conversations, you get a sense of their identities and you start to get a sense of what they really care about, their values, in other words, um, and how that influences their decision making. And it's not a, it's all, not always a straightforward case, not always, because as we know, uh, and you always have to try to put yourself in the shoes of those people. You would have to ask, you know, what would I do if I were in that particular situation? Um, so there's, you know, you can always try to justify your decision in terms of, let's say, uh, ideology or something like that. 
where in reality your decision was based on something else for example or some kind of grievance or maybe just a mistake that you made but you will always try to put the best spin on it and say well this is because of the values that i hold therefore this is you know uh, 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 but that's a natural process uh, to to give you an example uh, from Cold War history, the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was uh, this is the most debated and written about conflict of the Cold War era. 1962, Nikita Khrushchev sends missiles to Cuba. Historians are trying to figure out why did he do that, and there's not a great amount of evidence, but there's some evidence. So. Uh, originally historians, and here we're talking about mainly Western historians writing in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, argued that it was actually a, a, a strategic decision. So you can turn in, you can explain it in security terms. The Soviet Union did not have enough um, enough um, long range ICBMs, and therefore they needed to place uh, intermediate and medium range ballistic missiles in Cuba to compensate for their for their strategic for, for strategic weak, weakness that they had, so that is that was an an explanation of Soviet action that was peddled for years and decades until the early 1990s when we had uh, some late Sergei Mikoyan who was the son of Anastas Mikoyan and so prominently placed observer also a great scholar of Latin American politics in his own right and he would he actually made an assertion that became extremely influential in Cold War historiography. He said that actually Khrushchev did not send missiles to Cuba for or any sort of strategic reasons whatsoever. But in reality, it was basically a value-based decision. That is to say, he was worried about the, the future of Cuban revolution. He, he was worried that the Americans would invade Cuba and overthrow Castro, and he loved Castro so much, he wanted to, uh, he wanted to defend revolution. So you can see that this is a value of, you can interpret this as a value decision based on his belief in communism or something like that. When I tackle this question in the book, I looked at China, actually. And I ask the following question. Is it, you know, it's clear that Khrushchev wanted to save Cuban revolution. But the question is, why did he want to save Cuban revolution? If you close, if you if you analyze his language and how he talked about it, it becomes apparent that he wanted to save the Cuban revolution for a very particular reason. That is to say, uh, it's not out of great love for Fidel Castro. It is because if, if Cuban revolution failed, then uh, what would happen is uh, uh, the Chinese would then accuse him of failure of leadership that he lost Cuba to the American imperialists and this would undermine his prestige. So you go from kind of strategic reasons uh, oh, and by the way, and also and here's another thing. I also reinterpret strategic reasons. I look at how Khrushchev thought about those strategic reasons. You can see that he actually cared about it, uh, but he cared about those in the in the different kind of way. So, for example, he uh, uh, he was really deeply concerned that the Americans put missiles in Turkey, nuclear missiles in Turkey. And uh, when he talked about it, he said, "Well." You know what we're doing in Cuba. This is just doing the same, giving the Americans the same kind of medicine that they're they're giving us. We're just doing what the Americans are doing to us, which is actually interesting. You could you could you can interpret this as a strategic move, or you can interpret it as a kind of a almost righteous indignation. What? How? You know, the Americans think they can do anything to us, and we cannot do this to them. That's not fair. So this is like a sense of fairness, a sense of you know of of. Um, of, of, of being recognized as an equal of the United States. So, so you can see how this simple framework of strategic you know, defense security versus values, that is belief for revolution, becomes then warped and transformed in many, many various ways that reflect almost on Khrushchev's personality and his personal desire for being seen as, a, as just as big of a guy as, as Kennedy, and his personal desire for being seen as a leader of a great power, and his personal desire to be not to be criticized by the Chinese and so that they undercut his prestige. So, so this is where it's interesting. 
Yeah, that's why, uh, uh, Leah, you know, you have a fantastic, very interesting question about uh, about values. But this is we need where we need to kind of start to decipher those values and understand where you have values, where you have interests, where those values are just that you profess to espouse are actually just rationalizations for uh, actions that you that you pursue for other reasons. Yeah, that becomes extremely complicated. And the whole clarity of history is suddenly suddenly gives way to this great fuzziness where you don't know why things happen. And unfortunately, this is what I do in my book, but that just, you know, it's just to say that, uh, you know, history is a complicated business. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sergey. I think uh, this is a, a great um, point to <laughs> finish our uh, talk for today. Um, so thank you very much to people who join us today. Um, and we are looking forward to your new book. Very yes, soon. yes, everybody, everybody <laughs> here, you have to buy this new book, yeah? And you can use it as a door stopper. Uh, uh, it'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you <laughs> too modest. Um, all right, thank you so much, and um, goodbye, everyone. All right, thanks for having me. Bye.